Welcome to C-SPAN's Afterwards. My name is Angela Stent. I'm director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies at Georgetown University. And my guest today is Peter Collier, and he is the author of Political Woman, The Big Little Life of Jean Kirkpatrick. Uh, Mr. Collier is a prolific biographer. Uh, he's written biographies of the Kennedys, the Rockefellers, the Fords, and the Roosevelts. Um, and we're very pleased to have him here today. Jean Kirkpatrick was a pioneer in many ways. She was the first American woman to be ambassador to the United Nations. She also elevated that position to cabinet rank. She was a very important political player in both the Democratic and then the Republican parties. She was also controversial. Her political ideas were often criticized. She was a neoconservative who in the end broke with her neoconservative colleagues over the Iraq war but she certainly really was an outstanding political figure during the Reagan era. So uh, my first question really is, you have written biographies of presidents, of uh, business magnates. Why did you decide to write this biography of Jean Kirkpatrick? And maybe if you could say just something about who she was, maybe for our younger viewers and listeners who may not know very much about her. Well, Jean was uh, somebody who had established herself as a public thinker, an intellectual, public intellectual uh, in the 1970s. She had uh, been a player in the Democratic Party. She had been disturbed by what had happened to the Democratic Party, the takeover, as she saw it, of hostile elements with the McGovern campaign consolidated under Carter. She had been disturbed further, deeply disturbed by the um, seeming evidence of America to counter the Soviet rise in the post-Vietnam era and by the number of countries that came under Soviet dominance. And she had been a woman without a party in some sense and had, you know, written uh, pieces uh, in largely in Commentary magazine that came to the attention of Ronald Reagan and somewhat reluctantly she had met with Reagan and decided that he was a man of vigor, uh, a man uh, she you know saw as being close to the men in, in his spirit that she had grown up around in the southwest part of the United States, Oklahoma, and later in, in Illinois, people with Midwestern virtues, somebody able to you know, be, you know, uh, in a sense, um, quiet about himself, to understand himself, not have to explain himself constantly, and make, you know, decisions. Mm -hmm. One of the famous things he had said to his foreign policy advisor, Richard Allen, she had heard about, was Allen, who was advising him when he was running for uh, president early in 1979, had said, well, what's your view of the Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. And Reagan famously looked up at him and said, uh, we win, they lose. How do you like that? You know, and Jean heard that, and she really, really liked that. And so she, you know, uh, got to know Reagan, who really courted her, and eventually became part of his apparatus, and she brought with him centrist Democrats like herself, who had been alienated by what had happened in the Democratic Party, by the radical takeover, mm -hmm. the defeatism, the appeasement-mindedness that took over the Democratic Party. And they, these centrist Democrats, really gave a kind of intellectual vigor, intellectual spinal cord to the Reagan administration, in foreign policy particularly. And in terms of how I got to know her, you know, or why I write yeah, about her, I guess, is your her. question. <laughs> right. uh, uh, I, I got to know her personally, and mm -hmm. I was starting a book publishing company in the late 90s, and I thought, God, Jean Kirkpatrick ought to write a book. She was. You know, she was, a, in a sense, a memory at that mm -hmm. point, but it was a very good memory of a time when the United States had morally and physically rearmed itself and fought the Cold War, you know, to mm -hmm. victory. And she had been one of the ones who really, in some sense, put the stake through the Soviet heart. And so I thought, well, this is a great book. I didn't know, of course, by that, at that time that she had tried to write a book right after she left the Reagan administration, taken a very sizable advance, and just there was something in her she could not use the she the, the first person singular pronoun was an enemy of Jean's. Mm -hmm. She couldn't bring herself to do this sort of even modest revelation, personal mm -hmm. revelation has to go into a memoir. So mm -hmm. that had failed. And you know, I, I talked to her at great length trying to convince her and 
No, she'd say, yeah, I'd like to, but I can't. And finally I said, well, I'll help you. I'll do these extensive interviews with you and do basically a syllabus, and then mm -hmm. you can use that, to, you know, naive of me in some yeah. sense, to edit. Uh, you know, you can work as an editor of your own life rather mm -hmm. than as a creator of your own <laughs> life. And um, we went along like that for, you know, quite a number of conversations, and uh, she eventually <coughs> was unable to really commit herself to do it. And after she died, I thought, this is a kind of promise to keep. I mean, it's not, as she herself said, a big life, but it's a very important life. Mm -hmm. And I did this book to keep her memory green. In some Thank sense. you. And that, of course, explains the title, too, yeah. The Big Little Life. Let's go back to her origins, really, because it was very important for her, the values that she learned in the American heartland. But as you talk about in the book also, she grew up in a society where um, the values were very good, but where girls and young women were not necessarily encouraged to get a four-year college degree or have a career. So if you could talk a little bit about her family background and the things that really informed her view of life and of society and politics as she was growing up. She grew up in, she was born in Duncan, <laughs> Oklahoma, and uh, you know, her, her family background had some of the over, overtones of a kind of Edna Ferber novel filled mm -hmm. with adventure, land grabs, you know, mm -hmm. <coughs> filling out the, the great part of what was first Indian Territory and then Oklahoma Territory. Mm -hmm. And she was always very conscious of that, about these origins, about being an American in some profound sense that it was part of this American creation that had occurred <coughs> relatively late in the 19th century when Oklahoma was really kind of coming, coming into being. And she, she was part of a family that were <coughs> yellow dog Democrats in some yeah. sense, although her mother was very genteel and refused to allow that term to be right. used. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> she had, had a very powerful father who was an mm -hmm. oil man, an oil driller, and uh, who made a good living for the family, but was a sole practitioner and was subjected to the cycles of depression, boom and bust of the oil industry, mm -hmm. and had ultimately to move away from Oklahoma mm -hmm. as, oil, uh, as the oil moved toward uh, Illinois, so to speak. And uh, <coughs> she was most likely to succeed in her family. The first grant, <coughs> excuse me, I gotta have a drink of water. Sure. <laughs> <coughs> grandchild on, on both sides of the family. <coughs> the, um, you know, one, one of the uh, two leading students in her high school, yeah. <coughs> high achieving, overachieving, mm -hmm. very ambitious, but she came of age right, <laughs> right after the war. And mm -hmm. um, there was a sense that, you know, even talented girls were supposed to excel in all these things and then come home and get married. Right. She uh, got her father to allow her to go to <coughs> a kind of semi-finishing school after graduating from high school, a uh, place called Stevens College in Missouri, mm -hmm. which was a two-year college, and it, it was uh, supposed to finish women for, you know, uh, the domestic arts, as it were, of yeah. raising a family. And she was uh, unwilling to accept that, and it was part of a continual battle. There was a kind of incredible pride about her inside the family, but a feeling, you know, well, what is sister, as they like to call her, going to do <coughs> if she, mm -hmm. you know, leaves home and if she's not <coughs> going to have a family of her own? What is she going to do? What does a woman do? What does a woman do? Mm -hmm. And um, she actually wangled <coughs> permission for them to get to Columbia. And she wanted to go there because she said, New York is where big ideas happen, and I want yeah. big ideas. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about her studies <coughs> in Columbia, um, the influences on her life. Um, it was there, of course, that she met her husband, Evron Kirkpatrick, who was a major, major influence um, in, on her life. And then also um, the pro one of the professors she studied with, Franz Neumann, a great expert on totalitarianism, a refugee himself. Um, if you could talk really about, the, if you like, the intellectual influences on her while she was at Columbia and that, how that formed her views on politics. Well, she came there as a very serious student. And the <clears throat> one of the things that she always said that you know, she first remembered about being at Barnard and later at Columbia mm -hmm. for graduate school. Uh, one kind of continuous experience right. was the 1948 presidential 
campaign. Um, she was in a huge minority.